Hi, everyone. Just before we get going, I want to remind you that everything we talk about and discuss should not be considered as investment advice. The purpose of what we talk about on Catherine Murray Media and Markets on YouTube, as well as Catherine Murray in conversation with on my podcast, should be viewed as informational and entertainment purposes only. Please definitely do your own research, your own homework, and definitely consult an investment professional before making any investment decisions. And also to note, some of us might hold positions in some of the stocks uh, that we discuss. Uh, Mark, great to be able to catch up with you and um, and to get your views um, on the global economy. And there's so many different moving pieces and, and parts these days. And I think a lot of... Um, unknowns, uncertainty, and a big debate in terms of inflation versus deflation, and therefore where interest rates go. I think that that's just so much of the focus. Um, but stepping back, the way you look at the world, from what I understand, is you know your focus has been and continues to be on the foreign exchange, the FX market, which tells the story, I think, of so many other parts of the market, because it all kind of gets encapsulated within FX, correct? Yeah, I, I, I've spent my career in foreign exchange, and I still uh, am very enthusiastic and passionate about it as a market. It's the biggest uh, market in the world. Its average daily turnover is $6.6 trillion. What that means, it's a mind-boggling number. What it means is that in, in one week, the foreign exchange market sees enough turnover to cover a year's worth of trade. And like you said, if, if the crux of the other markets too, so if an internet, people who are thinking about your, their 401ks or their pension funds, if the currency component, if you have a basket of international bonds, the currency component could be two thirds of your total return. That gives you a sense of the relative volatility. And if you have a basket of international stocks, the currency component can give you a third of your total return. Hmm. So getting the currency right for me, it offers a big uh, window glass picture to observe, observe these other phenomenon, as well as you can get that currency right, you can get your international investment portfolio correct. I actually didn't know that it had that much of an impact, specifically on the fixed income market. What it really represents, I think, it just shows you how volatile, I mean, that the currencies are relative to fixed income. And I know we've been going through a very uh, uh, volatile period where we've seen the U.S. yields move around quite a bit. And it's quite shocking that even, even after some strong inflation reports, our, the U.S. 10-year bond yield is still below 1.4%. And this past week, our high-yield bonds, our, we're called junk bonds, that yield fell for the first time below the rate of inflation. Yeah, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, and I want to pick up on that point in one second, but I want to go back to something you, you said, which is what, it, six, $6 trillion of foreign exchange is, is traded in a week or a yes. day? In a six, week. Six trillion a average every day. Every day. Um, why, why does that happen? Who's trading it? What, what is that for? Is that companies? Who is that? Sure. Yeah, that's another thing I like about the foreign exchange market the participants, almost everybody you can think of. From the very small end, tourists, or think about what's happened most recently under COVID. Many people who, many Mexicans who might be working in the United States send money back home to their families. Those, those worker remittances going into Mexico have been and continue to be greater than their trade surplus. Wow. So we've got worker remittances. You've got, of course, you've got the multinational corporations. You've got asset managers. You have as well, you've got the uh, speculators. And, and there you've got a, a deep market, futures, options on futures. And increasingly, uh, both in uh, Asia, especially Japan, and also in the U.S. and Russia, there's been a rise of retail investors. Hmm. Uh, the, the, uh, one of the attractive things about the currency markets is it's liquid. And it's highly leveraged. You know, when you buy a stock in the United States, the Federal Reserve sets the margin money, how much money you need to put down. So if you buy $100 worth of stock, the Federal Reserve says you need $50 to buy that $100 worth of stock. It's like a down payment. But in the, in the currency markets, it doesn't work that way. Actually, in the capital markets, it doesn't work that way. The margin money is really not a function of how much you're buying, but how much you could lose before your broker or your banker can liquidate your asset. 
Hmm. So for example, the biggest futures contract in the world is a $5 million Fed funds futures contract. You or I could control that contract for a couple thousand dollars. Wow. That's leverage. But the reason we could control it such a little amount of money is because you can't, it doesn't move that much. You're not going to be able to lose that much money before your broker can liquidate the asset if you don't come up with more, more margin money. So it's just, so the currency market's attractive 24 hours a day. My week begins Sunday afternoons when Australia and New Zealand open up. Mm -hmm. And it really finishes uh, Friday uh, late afternoon. Uh, when New York closes. And I think that it's a 24-hour day market. Of course, liquidity is not always there uh, as full as it is. But what we've learned from this trade cost analysis is the most efficient time to trade is when everybody else is, which typically uh, is in the European afternoon, the U.S. morning. Interesting. It, it, is that across the board then for equities as well? Well, equities, uh, well, there are like the... Uh, there are 24-hour a day indexes that trade. Uh, and of course, in the US, we have ADRs, American Depository Receipts, that allow you to trade other countries' equities, mm -hmm. individual companies. But the equity market, you know, in the US, the equity market, even though most, of, most people, when they think about the market, they think about the equity market that dominates our attention. But the equity market in the US is open from 9.30 in the morning in New York till four o'clock. And there's yeah. some markets like the livestock markets and some of the agricultural markets that open for even a much shorter period. Which is another reason I like the foreign exchange market. I know a lot of Americans, a lot of US people think that the sun rises and sets on the United States, but I know it doesn't. And that's mm -hmm. why my, I, I really keep London hours in New York. By the time I get up in the morning, uh, European markets are well underway and Asia is closing up for the day. Mm -hmm. So by the, time Amer by the time the US wakes up, uh, half the day is over. Hmm. Right. right. And, and Mark, just to, um, you know, give us a little bit more context and, and enlighten us, because I don't actually often have these more in-depth conversations as it relates to FX. Um, so I'm kind of curious, given the fact that there's essentially so much margin available um, to, to trade for an exchange, as you described, um, that means you're, you're really just looking for, it, it sounds as though, you know, these are really short-term trades for people who are involved because there's not a lot of movement. Is that right? Well, I would say that there's uh, different players with different time horizons. For example, an asset manager, someone who's, who's buying, say, a, uh, a German stock in the United States, they might hedge that currency exposure for three mm. months, six months, maybe even as short as one month. Uh, think about what happens to your country, uh, you're borrowing U.S. dollars, you've issued a dollar bond, and yet you're going to be using that money at home. How do you protect that exchange rate? That might be a much longer term hedge. I think that short term, um, short -term speculators, short term participants in the market, whether hedge funds, uh, bank traders, individuals, I think that they tend to be a momentum traders, trend followers, mm -hmm. uh, and using those kind of technical tools, while medium and longer term uh, people are trying to position themselves or hedge are really looking at other macro factors. You okay. know, I talk to a lot of businesses these days and businesses, you know, you know, imagine this, they, they expect to uh, have to pay, they expect an invoice, but they have to buy this. They're buy, paying for a German machine tool three months from now or six months from now. They want to be able to lock in the price today. They're not really speculating as much as they are uh, trying to lock in certainty. Mm -hmm. uh, Think about like all these cross-border mergers and acquisitions. Uh, a, a modest move in the currencies could, could make a deal that looks very profitable, turn very unprofitable. So hedging the currency risk, it's a major risk for international investors. Mm -hmm. and, and so Mark, just to, on that note, as we think about the macro picture and we'll kind of drill into, um, you know, what's most important to you as you look at the world today and, and try to figure out where we go from here. And you have been uh, listed as a visionary by Forbes. Just give us a bit of your background in terms of um, your past career at HSBC and what you're doing now. Yeah, sure, I have a, a rather, relatively unusual background for someone who spent a career on Wall Street. I'm a good old liberal arts major, a political science, humanities, which at this college I went to was uh, philosophy, history, and religion. I have a master's in American history, which naturally took me into international relations, but I did another master's at the University of Pittsburgh in international relations. 
I teach international relations at various schools. I am affiliated with NYU. I teach at Darden. Uh, I've been doing some work with Fordham students most recently. Uh, I, when I first got out of school, uh, I, I don't have, uh, and that's one of the things I like about foreign exchange too, especially when I got in, involved, there weren't a, it wasn't old enough to have people bringing in their uh, daughters or their sons or their nieces or their nephews. It was really much more of like a uh, self-starters. A lot of people I know in foreign exchange began like I did. I'm the first one in my family to go to college. Oh, nice. And there's a lot of people like this in foreign exchange, which is what attracted me to it as well. You, you live on your wits and you can you learn as much and as fast as you want. And so I've spent my career uh, working with uh, at hedge funds, at banks, and uh, working with large asset managers, working with wealthy uh, families, and working with corporations. These days, after spending 15 years at Brown Brothers, which is a, as a custodial bank, really helps the large asset managers sort of do the back office functions, if you will, or the middle office functions. I joined Bannockburn, which is a small uh, outfit out of uh, the Midwest that really specializes and helping small and medium-sized businesses. Here's what happens, I think. You know, the foreign exchange market, like in buying a house, the price is really the spread between the bid and the offer. Now, a lot, a lot of these large uh, companies, large asset managers, they pay the spread that they are shown is sometimes as small as a thousandth of a penny. Hmm. And yet, these small and medium-sized businesses, which are really the backbone of America, when we look at what they're paying, sometimes they're paying a spread of three and four percent. And so at Bannockburn, we're really just trying to bring those institutional efficiencies, hmm. uh, transparencies, and analysis to a small part of the market that sort of is treated like tourists. Hmm. In, in other words, the small, medium-sized businesses don't get the kind of focus or attention that a large, a larger bank um, would would provide. Correct. Yeah, I, I think that, we, we, again, it comes down to the price and transparency of the price. And um, and it's expensive, you know, for a bank to write, even write a ticket. And all those people who get involved from the risk managers to the traders, salespeople, you have a lot of fingers, like a lot of mouths that have to be fed, so to speak. And yeah. what Bannockburn tries to do is just try to reduce some of those inefficiencies to give to secure that for this, uh, what we think is a very small, a small but a very important segment of the market. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is it that you, what, what kind of characteristic or attribute do you think was most important in terms of your ability to provide uh, great advice? And, and, and as you say, you know, you know, really kind of stay on top of everything. What, what do you attribute that to? Yeah, I don't know, partly it's luck, partly it's personality. But I think there's a certain type of resilience that one needs. I find that when I'm working with young, new analysts, young people who are just getting their feet wet, so to speak, uh, they're afraid of being wrong. And so being wrong, they think is something bad and uh, prevents them from being right, from like going out on the limb and ha having, taking their view. And I, th I think that it's sort of like what Thomas Edison once said. He said he didn't fail. He found 10,000 ways it didn't work. And I think, it's, uh, I think that's very true in the, for me in my experience in the foreign exchange market, because of course, uh, there's so many uh, choices, so many decisions that have to be made. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that are unpredictable that one cannot be, one, one is never always right. And when one is right, it's always partial. And so I think that this sort of type of resilience, a thick skin and not being morally defeated by being wrong. I think mm -hmm. of an American baseball player, a very good baseball player might be, might get three hits out of every 10 times that they go to the, to go, they get a chance. Three hits. I know in foreign exchange in the markets, we got to do a bit better than that. Mm -hmm. But, but being, <laughs> being wrong is, is not something uh, uh, that should be like, uh, we, we make our best guess based on the information set we have at the time. It's always incomplete. And so I think that kind of humility and resilience to being wrong, I think helps uh, help get, overcome some of these uh, dark places we can be. Yeah, no, that, that's a great point. Um, you know, stamina, I think, is, is key. And you, you often see, I think, people on Wall Street who really, you know, you have to have stamina and you really have to have thick skin. That is for sure. Um, but, but I think as well, when we think about this, the skill, well, those are skill sets. I mean, those are probably the most important skill sets in some ways for success. But when you think, but so that's one side of perhaps, you know, what, what it takes. The other side is 
when you think about the macro picture and um, like looking at all the different information today, and as you say, it's always going to be incomplete. Let's look at the, the world today and, and get your thoughts in terms of what's most important for you to get right right now in terms of where we go. I mean, because everyone's focused on inflation and somebody I spoke to said, you know, if everyone's focused on inflation, whatever happens in terms of moving the markets, it won't be anything about inflation or interest rates. It's going to be something else. But then we know that geopolitical events really don't seem to affect the market too much. Obviously, we have had a pandemic. It's affected the market, but we've rebounded. We'll see where we go from here. So I don't know, maybe, maybe the number you know, I'm, I'm rambling on here for a second, but but maybe it's the variant because that's the other aspect, of course, that, that people are so focused on right now. But what are you seeing? Yeah, so I, I guess for me, the, the uh, for me and where I like, uh, where I spend a lot of my time is really uh, where we are in the big dollar picture. And, and the reason I say that is partly because right now, for example, I find that there's a very good, that is to say, tight relationship between market expectations of Fed policy. So for that, I'd look at the December of next year, December 2022 euro dollar futures contract as some gauge of what the market's expecting for Fed policy. And uh, there's a tight fit now between the dollar's exchange rate. And what's happening is that even though the Federal Reserve now says that uh, uh, most likely, you know, the, the majority now say that a Fed hike uh, in 2023, the market's pricing in uh, not only one hike by the end of next year, but pricing in about a 60% chance of a second hike. And so I know a lot of people say, well, this is very bullish for the dollar. And I'm not, so, I'm not convinced it is. I, I sort of think that what's happened is that the co- even before the pandemic struck, the U.S. was running a relatively large budget deficit for normal times, over 4% of GDP. And I think that uh, what's happened on the other side of the pandemic is we have a, even a larger deficit and a large trade deficit. And typically what I have found is that when the U.S. has what is called the twin deficits, such large twin deficits, the U.S. has to offer higher interest rates to keep the money at home as well as attract foreign savings to the U.S. And if that doesn't happen, then the dollar has to bear a greater part of that burden. And so in my work, I sort of think of the dollar as having three big cycles uh, since we broke off of Bretton Woods in the early 70s. We had the Reagan dollar rally. That ended with joint intervention. We went through a 10-year bear market. We had a Bill Clinton dollar rally. Uh, That was a tech bubble. And uh, right around that same time as the tech bubble, of course, the euro was born. And of course, it fell right away from like 119 to about 85 and a half cents. Mm-hmm. Intervention again then uh, stops the euro from falling, which means stops the dollar from rallying. We go through about another 10-year bear market. And then on the other side of the great financial crisis, uh, the dollar began rallying. And for about a year now, uh, actually about the late 2019, I thought that that third big dollar rally since the end of Brent Woods was over. The pandemic, of course, those early days uh, last uh, February and March saw the dollar spike up. Uh, but since then, we've been really been broadly trending lower. And uh, I think that a lot of people now are at these crossroads. They see the Federal Reserve likely ahead of the European Central Bank, ahead of the Bank of Japan. uh, And they think that the dollar, therefore, uh, should rally. And I'm just not convinced that the case, unless we we see much higher interest rates in the U.S., which uh, we're actually moving at the long end of the curve, at least in the opposite direction. My concern, too, is that while a lot of people, like you say, are focused on inflation, part of my job is not to just look at where we are now, but look to where we might be in six months or nine months or a year. And you know, the last three US economic downturns have been preceded by a doubling of the price of oil. And it's kind of interesting, I say, because oil prices, the rise in oil prices isn't inflationary. It, it spells the end of the business cycle. Hmm. And, and the price of oil has doubled now since, uh, since the vaccine was announced, since the US election in early November last year. And so I'm worried that not so much in the very near term. We still have some fiscal stimulus in the pipeline. We still have uh, uh, some pent up demand. But I'm thinking that uh, by the middle of next year, a year from now, uh, the, we got fiscal cliffs, fiscal policy will get tighter. Some of this pent up demand, I see it even in my own household, uh, mm-hmm. uh, going to sports events or going to concerts or going out to restaurants. Uh, 
we have some pent up demand from being locked up for a while, but mm -hmm. that's not going to last forever either. And I think that a lot of that pent up demand is going to be exhausted mm -hmm. uh, in, in 12 months from now. And I think that the uh, this doubling of the price of oil. So I, I'm, I'm worried that a year from now, we'll be talking about 3% growth, but only in the rear view mirror. That we're gonna go back to a status quo ante. Yes, our lives might have changed, work might be more flexible, but at the end of the day, the, the tough condition that we were in uh, pre-pandemic, uh, low inflation, low growth, I'm afraid that we haven't solved those problems and they're gonna come back and haunt us. Interesting, and, and so much to pick up on there, Mark. And um, you know, I'm hearing kind of your, your views and how you're you're shaping your thought process here. Um, so, uh, again, a number of things to pick up on. First, let me start with oil because you say that when you see a double in the price of, of oil, that precedes a recession. And I'm I'm wondering. You know, and we we both know on Wall Street, you never should say it's different this time. Uh, but I do wonder if it is a little bit different this time, only because, um, well, certainly in Canada anyway. You know, we've seen so much um, vilification of of oil and and a pullback in capex, and that's not to true in other areas, and we're a very small player in the big scheme. But um, you know, I'm I'm just wondering. When we look at that price movement, you know, what does it really represent, and does it really represent what you've seen in the past to be able to make that call? Yeah, no, you raise a good point. And so, one way to think about it is how much oil you use to produce every unit of GDP. And of course, we become more efficient. Uh, my wife and I drive a car that gets sixty miles to the gallon of gasoline. It's a hybrid, and so mm -hmm. I, it looks like other other people in high income countries are able to do that as well. But our oil consumption hasn't gone down. Right. And, and the same is true, like even, in, I mean, despite like this bad rap that coal is getting as well, US coal output is higher this year than it was a year ago. Is it? So, Why? I'm surprised. Yes, I, I think that it partly reflects the demand for electricity, which is still, you know, it's gonna take years to really wean us our, ourselves off of carbon, not only oil, but coal as well. And we're not there yet. But so I, I do think it could be a little bit different. We could become a little bit more efficient uh, using of energy. Uh, but I'm not sure that in the, in the scheme of things, that it's going to be significant enough that the higher price of gasoline or heating our houses in the winter, the less money we have to buy these other things that we might want. And so what it really reflects, this is a, an important point too, I think what a lot of people do is they see, they, they see their prices that they're paying for groceries. Or, say the price of beef goes up. And, they, and they, they get worried, well, this is inflation. And economists tend to not to, when they think about inflation, they tend to talk about the general price level. So if the price of beef has gone up, there's a substituting effect. People buy more pork or more chicken or more of these Beyond Burgers or these uh, plant-based uh -huh. beef alternative kind of things. And so I, I do think there's a substitution aspect here as well. But in general, the... Uh, you know, the, U the world is still consuming something on the magnitude of 100 million barrels of oil a day. And it really hasn't gone, it might not have gone up as much, but it hasn't gone down really either. Mm -hmm. um, but, and, and essentially, though, that the price going up just is, is um, will end up causing consumers to, to spend less in other areas of the market. But, yeah, I think but, that that's the way yeah. like the Federal Reserve has viewed it. It's almost a tax on consumption. Okay. So much of what we have it has oil products, the plastics. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we are, even our plants, you think that plants, how do plants use oil? Well, it's the pesticide and fertilizer. Mm. Uh, and so it's, we, we still are, I, I think we really have to think through what it means to be carbon free. We just, I, I think many of us aren't really aware of how much carbon we use. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so I hear you on that. Let me go back to the other aspect you talked about, though, um, as it relates to the U.S. dollar, and that that's you know your your focus point, U.S. euro. Um, and when you have twin deficits, you said that that should indicate that the U.S. dollar will essentially decline historically. Yes. Yes, unless we can offset that with higher interest rates, but the Federal Reserve is doing their best to keep interest rates low. Okay. And, and so let me ask you this as well. I mean, I remember when I was at Deutsche Bank and um, 
we uh, our foreign exchange strategy, I cannot remember who what, what his name is now. I'm sure you would know him, but he had a great call on the US dollar, and it was after the tech boom bust, and it was for a declining US dollar, and he was right, and he stayed on that call. And I remember traveling with him, and he said that you, when you see a FX trend or currency trend, they tend to last seven to 10 years. Is that true? Is that accurate? And, you know, right now, it seems over the past couple of years, people have been really wondering which way the U.S. dollar is going to go. Do you think, and, you know, I heard you just in terms of the COVID impact on the U.S. dollar versus other countries and currencies, um, are we at the beginning of a new trend and that trend in your mind is going to be downward for the next seven to 10 years? Yeah, that's something like, I mean, I don't know, seven to 10 years. I usually think of it as five to 10, but, uh, but, it, it, but the point I think is fair that, we're familiar with the business cycle and how it affects bonds or Fed policy or even the stock market earnings. But in the currency markets, you know, it's always a relative value trade because when you sell one currency, you've got to buy, you buy another currency. You can't get out of this currency maze, if you will. And so, so it's not just what happens in the U.S., for example, that drives a dollar, but what happens on the other side with the other, cur with the other currency, the other country's currency. So, but I do think that uh, for various reasons, uh, they do get these long uh, cycles in the foreign exchange market, long-term trends. And the last trend, uh, be, I'd say, began in 08, 09, uh, to the dollar to the upside. And uh, it's been about a decade. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I think that the dollar is turning. And I think it, it, it's a question of how fast, how much it turns. And, you know, the, we, we talk about these huge moves which, you know, uh, b besides like thinking about the macro, there's always a money management about like, where do you put your stop? Where do you get in? How they're trying to balance that fear and greed. But I do think that the dollar does trend, foreign exchange market trends. If, that's a, we asked previously about like uh, skills one needs. Mm. I think that's very attractive to me about foreign exchange because one doesn't need a lot of ideas mm. because we have these long-term trends. Uh, you can be on a trend for a while and sort of just map it out. Mm -hmm. So, I, but I, I do think that the dollar has turned, uh, and it's going to take it maybe takes some while. And I, I think that uh, in my own experience, I sometimes I'm early on that because I'm trying to always anticipate what's going to happen. Uh, but uh, I began thinking the dollar's uptrend, that big third cycle, the o Obama Trump dollar rally. I thought it had ended, and I still haven't seen en enough compelling evidence yet for me to think that the, there's a new uptrend that's about to begin. Okay, but but that there could be a downtrend. That's that's your base case. I get so. Okay, what does that mean for um, the uh, the Canadian dollar? And of course, the BOC is uh, meeting this week. Yeah, the, I, I, so for me, sometimes the dollar is an actor in its own right, and sometimes it's like the fulcrum of a seesaw, and that's what it's partly doing right now. It's sort of this fulcrum of the seesaw. Those countries that look to be ahead of the Federal Reserve in the queue to adjust monetary policy. Canada would be one of those countries. Norway is one of those countries. Uh, Australia, New Zealand seem to be um, among those that early, uh, the front of the queue, so to speak. Those currencies have until very recently been among the strongest. We've seen some profit taking on them, but I would expect the same thing for Canada, where Canada typically is a bit ahead of the US in, the, uh, in adjusting monetary policy. Uh, beginning in April, they've begun slowing down their bond purchases. We don't expect a statement from the Federal Reserve to taper its bond purchases for, for a little bit while longer. Maybe it's the end of August at the Jackson Hole uh, Symposium the Federal Reserve puts on. Maybe it's the September FOMC meeting. But by the time those two events happen, we suspect that the Bank of Canada would have tapered further. They began buying by $5 billion Canadian dollars worth of federal bonds, they tapered to 4 billion and now they have 3 billion. I think they could taper again when they meet this week and that'll leave them with a little bit left to taper for the end of the year with a rate hike probably somewhere around the middle of next year. Mm -hmm. Mark though, is your assessment of the global economy strong enough, it doesn't sound like it is, for central bankers around the world to begin tapering and raising rates? Well, it's interesting uh, that you, you, know, you raise a very important point because we are seeing uh, already several emerging market countries raise interest rates. Uh, here in the Americas, Brazil and Mexico have already gone. 
Chile could be the third Latin American central bank to raise rates this week. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, Russia raise rates as well. We've seen some signs that uh, other countries in East Asia are preparing to raise interest rates. So I, I think that uh, the reason that they're raising interest rates for the most part is not because the economies are booming, but it's because during COVID, they will put their overnight interest rate very low. So low that it's below the rate of inflation. In some, in some emerging market countries, they're raising interest rates not because the economies are strong and robust, but really because they put down interest rates so low during COVID crisis. Uh, they, now they've got some rising price pressures. They don't have a lot of uh, degrees of freedom that the high income countries do like the United States or the Eurozone or Japan, where they can, they can be a bit more relaxed about it uh, as the economies recover. What's the interest rate, though, I, I don't know, the, in, in Brazil right now? Because I, I don't know if it was Brazil or Chile I was looking at, and it was astonishing, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so Brazil's right now, well, Brazil began the year at about 2.5%, their overnight rate called the Selic rate. Uh, they're now at four and a quarter. Okay. And uh, so is Mexico at four and a quarter now. And their inflation, both of those countries' inflation is even higher than that. So what a lot of economists like to look at to see the way that interest rates impact the economy is to look at it adjusted for inflation. And many emerging market countries still have negative real rates, real policy rates. So they, they're above zero, but they're below the rate of inflation. What does that mean for the average consumer listening to that? Because, you know, when we talk about, you know, I think everybody's aware that there's negative rates, negative yields going on in the world. Um, there's concern about slow growth. Maybe we get inflation or pricing pressures. Therefore, you've got deflation or your cash is earning you negative rates of return. What you've just described in some of those emerging markets and also adding to the equation, the conversation, taking a look at the amount of debt that Japan has had for all these decades. Um, what, what, what from that can we take and think about as it relates to Canada and the United States in terms of, you know, something that could go wrong? Yeah, I think that the thing that could go wrong, I think, is what you said before, is that what if this time is different? What if um, not so much this, uh, you know, the rise of airfares or the rise of, uh, uh, of, of things that had been depressed last year, restaurants, uh, hotels, but what if, what, if, what if the things that had caused inflation to trend lower for most of our lives since 1980, interest rates and inflation are trending lower. What if that period is over? And perhaps it could, there's a lot of reasons why it could be over. For example, uh, demographics have shifted. Uh, think about what happened. One of the things that happened in the, uh, in the 80s and then again in the 90s is the Soviet Union and China workforces were incorporated, were integrated into the world's labor markets and in producing goods. But now that the bulk of those people have already been incorporated. There's not another wave of people in the countryside in China waiting to join the markets. Same thing with the Soviet, former Soviet Union. So what would be big picture demographics? Maybe some people say that globalization was another cause of falling prices. And globalization might be going in reverse now. As we think about what the United States wants, we wanna be not only self-reliant in energy, we wanna be self-reliant in medical supplies. We wanna be self-reliant in semiconductor chips. Part of this makes sense. It's almost intuitive. For example, on the eve of the COVID crisis, the U.S. was importing roughly 95% of its penicillin from China. Hmm. It makes no sense to continue to do that. But from China's point of view as well, the U.S. has blocked its biggest producer of semiconductor chips as well as its biggest consumer of semiconductor chips. It makes no sense for China to be relying on foreign producers, foreign suppliers. Same thing China is is sort of captive, like most of the world is, to a duopoly between Android and the, uh, and the iPhone, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the operating system, the iOS. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wonder if it doesn't it make sense that China and other countries try to develop their own, not to become reliant on being sanctioned from the United States. So the idea here is that maybe uh, the other cause of, that could make this time different is that globalization goes into reverse and countries, not just the United States and China, want to become more independent, uh, stronger supply chains, which means onshoring or nearshoring some of these things that we, we produce cheaply elsewhere. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Um, so almost a decentralization of um, or deglobalization, which actually leads me to you know circle back to central banks for a second here because um, there was a warning I thought today uh, in the Wall Street Journal. I don't. I can't remember if it was the uh, IMF or the OECD. Um, talking about, it sounded like central bankers not being as coordinated as we've seen in the past in terms of lowering rates, rates for low, uh, longer or lower uh, in the bond buying programs. As, as we talk about countries now, you know, doing it on their own different time frames and the impact that that could have. Is, is that going to be an issue yeah, I, I think it's a, a very important point as well. You know, uh, my career began shortly after the Plaza Agreement in uh, 1985, where the major countries agreed to drive the dollar down. The and, U.S. dollar down. The U.S. dollar yeah. down, yes. And, and I think that there was like this period uh, from about 1985 till the early 90s, maybe the high watermark of international coordination. Uh, but I wonder if the issues that we face how countries have dealt with COVID, the manufacture of vaccines, the access to vaccines, uh, how this uh, all has to, that the, the challenges we face now are not something that subject, could be subject to international coordination on monetary policy as much as it's about individual countries coping with their own, their own challenges. On the other mm -hmm. hand, I do think that uh, you know, uh, after in the uh, in the years after Bretton Woods, of course, the IMF, the World Bank, sort of the it was sort of the the uh, Pax Americana, if you will, and then that system broke down in the uh, in the in the 70s, and we uh, and both in the U.S. and the U.K. gave rise to uh, this era, the Reagan Thatcher era, and I'm afraid that the global financial crisis in 08 and 09 ended that, and. Uh, maybe there's a lot of people speculating the U.S. is like ancient Rome, where the U.S. is, uh, this is the end of the U.S. empire, the Pax Americana, debating about who, whether it's going to be China or the Bitcoin or Europe that's going to replace the U.S. And I wonder if this is not similar to what happened back in the late 70s. We have a period of crisis and other countries, Europe, China, uh, Japan, they're not ready for, they're not ready to absorb or take that mantle of leadership. And so I wonder if what we're seeing now from the Biden administration on a number of different fronts, including this effort to reform co international corporate tax law, mm -hmm. not only the tax minimum, but sharing the tax revenues, uh, an alternative, uh, perhaps first presented at the uh, G7 and then the G20 meetings for an alternative, the Belt Road Initiative. Uh, most recently, uh, uh, the Biden administration has been floating this idea. You know, they, uh, Trump had taken the U.S. out of the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership trade block. Yeah. And how is the U.S. going to respond? How is the U.S. going to relate to Asia, uh, sort of a really key area in the world economy, population-wise, resources, manufacturing capacity? And what's being floated now is maybe a new type, a second generation of trade agreement focusing on digital trade. As another way, I sort of see this. What does as that mean? What does that mean, Mark? Well, I, I, th I think that digital trade would involve the uh, all this commerce that takes place over the internet, uh, intellectual property rights, uh, the, uh, the the uh, the sales, uh, tracking these things, uh, product identification, and so I, I think that what I sort of see perhaps forming sort of the way maybe uh, with children, the way we used to make crystals, right? We have a little piece of string, a yarn going into this uh, salted sugared water and uh, it just takes a piece of dust and it crystallizes. And I think that's perhaps what the Biden administration is trying to do on many different fronts, trying to have, a, trying to have the U.S. succeed itself. After the, after the four years of the Trump administration, a new multilateral effort on several different areas cooperation uh, on environment. Uh, we even Russia and China were, were like, uh, were invited to join with the U.S. on that. Uh, so I just see a, uh, an offensive by the U.S. trying to reestablish its leadership, which is why I think that the uh, congressional elections next year and then the presidential election in 2024 is so key to both the macroeconomic outlook, but also the political outlook, whether, whether this is going to succeed. Whether well, their initiatives right now will succeed. Um, so, in terms of one of their initiatives, as it relates to a digital tax, um, we should talk a little bit about what that means 
um, and whether or not it goes through. Yeah, sure. So, uh, so here, here's a challenge: is some some companies uh, think about like uh, uh, a Google or an Amazon. Just as a, just to take an easy example, Facebook. Uh, they sell product in other countries, but they only pay the, the, their tax obligation is to one. And so how to share that? And the U.S., at least until now, has been very reluctant. And so both Europe and Canada have suggested uh, a digital tax to, uh, to tax some of these digital giants to make sure they get some of those revenues, those tax revenues, given where their sales are. And the U.S. is opposed to this. The Trump administration was opposed. The Biden administration is opposed because U.S. companies are are seen to be singled out. Uh, the U.S. companies have these commanding heights. Uh, for example, there's, a, there's not something that's a, a European equivalent of an Amazon or a right. Microsoft. And so what to do with that? And so I, I think that this is the, uh, the tension right now is how much to do individual country versus how much can the OECD and uh, the G20 do? And I think that the tension is that there's two parts of this tax reform that is hoped to be able to replace the national efforts of the digital tax. And one is a global minimum tax of 15%. And the other is to share those tax revenues um, more, especially the taxes from the top 100 companies. And the, the problem I think that many countries see is that it does not look like it can pass the US Senate, which would be two thirds uh, majority to pass for the sharing the tax revenue. And the other pillar, what they call the pillar of the minimum tax, many countries in Europe, including Ireland, which of course has a low tax rate, uh, Estonia and Hungary, which are also members of the EU. And the reason that's important is that EU tax treaties require unanimity. Everybody has to agree. Mm. And so, that, and so the, there's an effort to push in this direction. Uh, I'd say the, the jury is still out whether it's going to be successful or not, but I think it's I, I think one doesn't have to be a partisan to see different hurdles that make it not necessarily the uh, 100% like locked in yet. Yeah, so Mark, it's pretty amazing to me because you know the mechanics and the, the technical aspect of what you just described that everyone in the EU has to agree. Um, I can't necessarily see that happening. And you know, it, it, part of the and then you you've got the Senate as well, two thirds. So it, it seems though this is a conversation that might not get anywhere or go anywhere. And why we're having a conversation, correct me if I'm wrong, is because a number of companies go to these low low tax jurisdictions and countries have gotten together and said, wait a second, let's let's not let this continue to occur. Is that correct? Yeah, I think you're right. I think that this is the ironic thing is we need to have this international cooperation so that individual in the countries like the U.S. can better control their multinational companies. And I think that, you know, it's sort of like that sometimes we can't solve a small problem. And so one strategy is to make the problem bigger and a bigger problem sometimes easier to solve than a small one. But I think that this tax evasion, I and mean, especially now when you think about how much money uh, countries, uh, high income countries, as well as developing countries have spent uh, combating COVID and trying to re minimize the social impact. And so, of course, it seems reasonable to expect that countries are looking for tax revenue wherever they can find it. And seeing this sort of this unfairness that some companies sell product in your country, but you don't get to collect taxes for it. And so, uh, but th you're right, there's a lot of broader tax evasion that the 50 or tax minimization, the way that- uh, Yeah, tax minimization, <laughs> yeah. right? <laughs> and, minimization. And so, yeah, so yeah. I, I think there's a real effort to try to like clamp down on that. But of course, the problem is that the U.S. has many different ways it can compete, many different levers of power. But a small country um, like Ireland or Estonia, they don't have as many like degrees of freedom. And so why shouldn't a country be able to compete by offering lower corporate tax rates? Right. The reason that we really we don't want them to is because it, 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 it comes at our expense. But from their own point of view, and this is why coordination is so difficult. There's not a lot of different ways that they can compete. And lower taxes, lower corporate taxes, is one way that they can compete. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it's going to be, what was the timing in terms of whether or not this gets approved? And of course, you bring up the midterm elections that um, might be a bit of a barrier as well, no? Yeah. So I think that the, uh, if I understand what uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen has suggested, 
they would like to have the 15% minimum corporate tax agreement, uh, probably part of a reconciliation bill in the U.S., which means that the uh, it won't need a we won't need it can be done basically with just the Democratic Party if all the Democrats in the Senate can agree on it. Uh, but the, uh, it's the other part that probably won't be uh, that that other part, which is sharing the tax revenue, and that becomes more of a 2022 story, I think. Uh, and in Europe, the same kind of thing. I think they would like to hope that it can be passed by the end of this year uh, mm -hmm. to be implemented then in 2022 or maybe even 2023. Uh, but so I think that the jury is still out, and there's a lot of. Uh, uh, horse trading and a lot of uh, a lot of arm twisting and concessions that will have to be made to win these people over and these countries. And I think that's just I think that's what it comes down to. It's not about the macro picture. It's about the sort of the the negotiation that take place country after country. Mm -hmm. um, Mark, it's amazing that, you know, our conversation is focused on so many different and interesting aspects of the world and what's going on. How do you take that and synthesize all that information and then think about the foreign exchange markets, um, maybe in terms of the trends that you're seeing and, you know, opportunities that you see in the market? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think that a lot of us, like a lot of my friends, my family, uh, they're happy reading the newspaper, uh, playing around on the internet, uh, sort of skimming things and reading what's happening. And I, I, think, I, I think the nature of my job and people who have jobs like mine is really drinking out of like the information hose, mm. uh, and I think that that's one of the challenges is how to how to uh, manage all this data and information. And you know, it's sort of like that that artist who drew uh, uh, he drew with like uh, dots, his paintings yeah. are dots. And if Point, you look pointillism, very, pointillism, yeah. right? And, and if you look very closely at it, you stand right like you, you look as close as you can at it. it it's very obscure. I'm not mm. sure what you're looking at. It's only when you step back. Do you get the perspective to be able to see what the dots represent? And so I think I, I spend uh, my time, my days are spent uh, doing two things, really, uh, reading and writing. Mm. And uh, the reading is part of the thinking process, trying to digest and trying to, uh, have, trying to be able to see the way the different parts fit into the whole, recognizing, of course, that not all the parts, it's sort of like uh, when I used to, as a kid, build uh, airplane models, sometimes I'd have parts left over. Hmm. And I think the same thing with following the news that not everything fits into a nice cogent picture. Yeah. And, and so what's the picture telling you right now? I mean, you, you kind of indicated it in terms of we're going to go back to the pre-pandemic world of um, lower, slower growth and inflation expectations that never meet the Fed's goals. Yeah. And it's not just the Federal Reserve either. You know, it's, it's remarkable that m many countries, uh, uh, high income countries, undershot inflation for years. And now what they do is, it's sort of typical of what politicians do, they promise something that they can't really deliver. Like they say, after undershooting inflation for so long, now we're gonna accept a higher average rate of inflation. Where the EU says, <clears throat> the, I'm sorry, the European Central Bank said, you know, they used to have this inflation target close to, but below 2%. And now they say, no, we're just gonna go with 2% and we'll accept overshoots. If only, if only right. it was that easy. And so for me, the uh, some things don't change. And one of them is that it's always challenging uh, to separate the, to try to make, take money out of the market on a short-term basis, but have a long-term view. And so it, it, it makes us have to be flexible and have to know, having to uh, understand as investors, our time frame. When we put on a trade, is this a short-term trade? Are we trading off of a headline, a piece of news, or is this a trend? And how do we manage that? And, and so right now I, I, I'm still looking at, uh, you know, the, the, the inflation numbers surprise a lot of people, and uh, we do have uh, the dollar being a little bit better bid than it was, uh, say, uh, in uh, April and May. Uh, we began rallying in June, and we're continuing here in early July. And I'm still looking for uh, this to uh, this to come to an end. But the euro is trading today uh, around 118. The low we made at the end of March was about 117. So I think that at those kind of levels, it, it becomes attractive again to try to buy the euro. Not that it's going to be right, but that. Uh, but you can. And I think this is really what separates the uh, the good traders uh, mm -hmm. from people who aren't trading anymore. And that is really a discipline and a risk management uh, to know that to have some level in mind money management where you know you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think that that 117 is interesting because that was a low we made in end of March, and if we go through that. 
uh, it that's the low for the year. It would suggest that another leg down. You know, on the eve of the uh, the election back in uh, November, the euro had traded down to 106. Why did it trade? Remind me, why did it trade down to 106 again? Well, I, I think that it was just. I mean, partly the euro was recovering. Uh, it had been recovering since March of last year, uh, and uh, uh, it had just pulled back. I think people were nervous about what the election could mean. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and we remember, we still hadn't had the vaccine yet by the time the election was announced. Well, I'm sorry, the vaccine wasn't announced by the time we held the election. So All there was right. just some nervousness, but just gives you a sense about how far we've come mm. uh, since the vaccine was announced. And maybe that's what's going on now. Some people suspect that the big uh, relief trade on the vaccine is being unwound. Interest rates, uh, some parts of the stock market, and then, of course, the dollar. And what do you think? I think it's interesting. I'm, I'm not sure we're there yet, uh, but that, that, that clearly is one of these scenarios that uh, seem to have some, uh, some sticking power. Mm -hmm. um, within that call and that outlook, um, what do you, where do you see the Canadian dollar going? Uh, yeah, the Canadian dollar is very interesting to me because partly, you know, many people forget about that uh, because of the rise of China or the EU, but Canada is still the U.S.'s number one trading partner. And uh, so I often think about the Canadian dollar because that's where a lot of our clients have transact. I tend to think the Canadian dollar, I have three big drivers for it. Uh, one is uh, if you, if people could be indifferent to holding Canadian dollars or U.S. dollars. And so wh why would they choose one over the other? Well, three reasons. One is uh, you look at what Canada exports it's a lot of commodities, and I use oil as a proxy, even though Canada, unbeknownst to some of my Canadian friends, Canada imports expensive oil in the East and exports cheaper oil in the West down to the U.S. Hmm. So Canada is also an oil importer, even though it's a net exporter. Uh, so I use oil as a proxy for commodities. And as you know, commodities have been doing fairly well lately, including oil prices. The second factor I look at, because I really think that when you look at the trade flows between the U.S. and Canada, and then you look at the capital flows, capital flows are so much bigger. So as a proxy to try to capture those capital flows, I look at short-term interest rate differentials. Canada's two-year yield against the U.S. two-year yield. Canada pays a small premium over the U.S. That's supportive of the Canadian dollar. And the third thing I look at, the third factor, is I think the Canadian dollar is a bit of a risk asset. If things are messy, if the, if the U.S. stock market is selling off sharply, the Canadian mm -hmm. dollar tends to suffer. And so I have those are the three big factors I look at. Uh, interest rate differentials using the two year as a proxy. O commodity prices looking at oil as a proxy and then risk appetites using the S&P 500 as a bit of a proxy. The Canadian dollar is still the strongest currency, major currency against the U.S. dollar this year, but it's given mm -hmm. some of those gains back. It had a big rally after the April Bank of Canada meeting, April 21st. Uh, the Canadian dollar, uh, I should say the U.S. dollar fell to about 1.2 against the Canadian dollar. This is very important chart support. We have been encouraging some of our clients to take profits uh, there. Uh, the Canadian dollar has now bounced uh, sharply off and face in sort of as part of this broader U.S. dollar recovery. But I think that the, uh, the time is still on the Canadian side that there's been this technical correction, and that when the Bank of Canada resumes its, its, uh, its tapering process and reaffirms that despite some slowness with the vaccine rollout, despite some, some poor jobs data in April and May, that the Canadian economy is still on track to accelerate here in the second half of the year, I look for the Canadian dollar to again test, or for the US dollar to test at 120 level in the Canadian, hmm. against Canada again. Hmm. Okay. Fascinating. Um, Mark, is there anything we didn't cover? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm the only sure thing you asked me about is. are the UFOs. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. That. Oh, I know. There is one thing. Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Yes. I, you know, the crypto has really captured, I, I think, like a whole generation of imaginations. And though, as I mentioned before, I have a master's in American history. And, and part of what I learned was that before we had the Federal Reserve, we had decentralized finance in the U.S. The Federal Reserve centralized finance was meant to solve the problems of decentralized finance. Imagine what we had in the U.S. where all the individual states all had their own banknotes. Hmm. 
And it's so, so to me, the, uh, the crypto is part of this era that we live in. And I kind of think that the era that we live in is a bit like that old Greek mythology story about King Midas. Remember, he's punished by the gods. And so he's, everything he touches turns to gold because he was mm. such a greedy person. And it seemed mm. to work out at first very well for him. He touched a tree, it turned to gold. Like, wow, that's cool. But then he hugged his daughter and he tried oh. to drink some wine. And I think that's where we are as a society. We're choking literally on too much. It turns out that, for example, on the eve of World War II, the French were not even eating a quarter pound of meat a week. And here we can have a quarter pound of meat for breakfast. Hmm. And what's the, what's the result of having too much animal protein? Cholesterol. What's the, what happens with cholesterol? Heart disease, the number one killer. Many people, I think, many things that we think are we're bothered by are of too much of excess. Mm -hmm. Too much cholesterol, too much animal protein, too much carbon in the air. And ironically, I think that we have too much money. You know, there's a story about uh, a, a young man who's got a, uh, who's taking a half a pig home to his family in China. And he's riding his motorcycle and he gets hijacked and they let him keep the motorcycle. The pork was more valuable. And the reason that pork becomes more valuable, the same reason why oil prices are up, is that the, the demand is stronger than the supply. Mm -hmm. China had a, had a cull, it's swine herd. OPEC has, has, has reduced the oil as, mm -hmm. as we face a surge in demand. And so I think the same thing is true about money. We have over $13 trillion of negative yielding bonds in the world. $13 trillion, it's just mind boggling what, <clears throat> what negative interest rates means. And so I think Bitcoin, crypto comes about at that moment in time when there's so much money. In my work, I compare uh, crypto to trees. But uh, what the crypto does is it takes the extra savings that would otherwise be chasing stock market valuations to even higher levels. Hmm. Or uh, bonds, I mean, we already have $13 trillion of negative yielding bonds. Or look at what's happening to real estate prices, house prices in Canada, the US, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, Scandinavian countries. They're surging. And so to me, the, the crypto is offering this uh, a place that savings is sort of a, a uh, just like trees are a carbon sink. I think crypto is like a savings sink. It takes mm -hmm. away that the savings that otherwise would be using, would be doing things that harm us. They would mm -hmm. be doing things that add to financial instability and sort of creating a little bit of an eddy for these savings. So I don't think that crypto is, is a form of money. I don't think it's going to replace the dollar. I think it's important that it's a, just another reflection of the era that we live in, like King Midas, we're choking on our wealth mm. and uh, this huge amount of capital that's looking for home. And yeah. crypto is offering one of these places that capital can be parked. That, that's really interesting, um, you know, as opposed to that money, to your point, going into other asset classes. Um, but so then let me ask you this. And I remember it was 2019, Mark, and I would say to friends, uh, you know, I was concerned that, you know, it was like the roaring 20s and it was, you know, 2019 because of the excess. And I don't know, just how people were operating. And um, obviously, then we had the pandemic. But what's interesting to your point is that there are trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars out there pushing up asset prices. And by the way, uh, we love to be printing even more money. So it seems as though, and I've had a conversation just over the past couple of days with a private equity person, that this doesn't look to be ending. So there's going to be the continuation of more money um, fueling these various asset classes. Is that what you see then occurring, even though we should be choking? Yeah, so I think that that's how we choke on it, though, is that, uh, you know, it goes into these paper assets uh, and drives up prices. But are, are our lives really any better? Because, be, you know, we have a couple of trillion dollar companies. Are, are our lives better? I, I'm not so sure that's the case, really. And I think that the problem I see happening is that it's sort of like what, what we learned or what I thought we learned in 08 and 09. And that is from uh, this uh, economist, Minsky that basically, if you have a long period of financial stability, that alone leads to instability mm. because it leads to leveraging, it leads to speculation, it leads to the idea. You know, think about mm. what banks were doing then. We make these loans, they're called ninja loans. J loans for, with, for the cosigner has no income, job, or assets. 
And the reason that they make the, the reason that banks made these loans is the same reason they loan to the oil patch. It's not because the because the borrower is going to be able to repay it. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But if they mm -hmm. don't, you have collateral. You have a person's house. And as banks knew, like what everybody else knew at the time, house prices only go up. It's okay to lend oil, money for oil, because oil is at $100 a barrel, and it's only going higher until it doesn't. And right. I think that, for me, that's the concern, is that I don't see how this story ends with a nice ending. That, uh, that the cost of keeping, this, keeping the treadmill running, if you will, is going to be a financial crisis. And, I'm not, and of course, I'm not smart enough to figure out where it's going to come. But I do like what, uh, what the person had told you previously said about that if everybody's looking in one direction, the crisis mm. is going to come from someplace else. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the question, of course, is, is where? And, you know, I, I always, you know, talk and think about a black swan event. And by definition, a black swan event um, can't be predetermined. But that's not really true because we do know of the individuals who made billions and billions of dollars during, uh, you know, because of the financial crisis. So, um, you know, it's trying to figure out what what won't work. And I guess my question to you would be, is there anything within the system right now, um, whether they're packaged products and derivative products or what have you, that, that does concern you? Well, yeah, but not so much in the financial system itself. It, it seems to me that the financial system is uh, is vulnerable, but to an ex an external shock. Okay. Uh, what could be that shock? You know, uh, uh, you, you know, it's, it's incredible. You know, we, we've I, I was in uh, New York City uh, uh, last week, and it was amazing that you could hardly tell that we were we're we're, we're still having a pandemic. Mm. And I worry that this uh, that. It's not so much this Delta variant that, that disturbs me uh, as the one after that or the one after mm -hmm. that. And the, uh, the efficacy of the vaccine for prevention is falling. So far, the efficacy for hospitalizations and uh, preventing fatalities is still very strong. But if you give me my, if, you, if, you, if, if this is a big game, if you will, of chicken between mother nature and us puny humans, I'll bet on mother nature. Mm. And uh, so I worry about the psychological. I mean, I already see this happening in Europe, where some countries are reimposing uh, lockdowns and social restrictions. Now they've had to do that. I think Tokyo is on its fourth uh, yes. state of emergency. The uh, the lockdown in Sydney looks like it's going to be uh, last longer. Uh, Spain is reintroducing social restrictions, and so I I, I can, I'm concerned about the psychological impact of what's going to happen if the vaccines do not keep up with the mutations. So that would be one big risk out there that could upset the apple cart. And the other that concerns me is really geopolitical in nature. Uh, so far, uh, again, there's been these small little skirmishes, uh, India and China, uh, and Middle East skirmishes. But what concerns me is, the, is, the, uh, is something that could happen uh, partly by accident, partly by miscommunicating signals. Uh, mm -hmm. The US is. The U.S. and other countries, including Japan, have taken have taken some interesting measures recently, uh, sort of promoting Taiwan, much to China's chagrin. China can continues to intimidate uh, through like aerial, like sending uh, dozens sometimes planes into Taiwanese airspace, encroaching on others' airspace and territorial waters. And I, I just think there's an accident there waiting to happen. And so I'm mm -hmm. concerned that uh, geopolitical geopolitics the virus can, uh, can upset a financial system, which, is more, which might be more precarious given the leverage nature of it and given the heights of valuation. Mm. Okay. Um, great, uh, great insight and, um, and, and conversation, Mark. So much to think about. I've really enjoyed it. It's been amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I think we've covered the world. I think and I hope. <laughs> and just uh, again for for viewers, new viewers of Canadian and US, and I think some overseas as well, um, maybe just reiterate exactly how, how you help family offices, corporations, et cetera, or how you're focused these days. Yeah, sure. So I, I think the, uh, you know, even though you can see foreign exchange prices on all kinds of uh, over the internet, over various systems, it's, it's freely available in a way perhaps it wasn't when I was younger. But I think that uh, despite, the, uh, despite the abundance of prices, I don't think the foreign exchange market is particularly transparent. And one doesn't really know the price one is paying. 
One is told a price, and often most of us are price takers, not price givers. And what we find is that just like there's a wholesale price for money, there's a retail price for money. Just like just like uh, my shirt, I know that I paid retail for it, and I know that the the, the store that I bought it from uh, paid wholesale. Mm. The same thing works for money. Uh, banks get money from central banks at zero from the Federal Reserve at negative interest rates from the Bank of Japan and from the European Central Bank. And then I look at my credit card and it says that uh, if I don't pay off my uh, balance, they're going to charge me 21%. Mm -hmm. that is the whole, that's the retail price for money. And what we find is that small and medium-sized businesses, small and medium-sized participants, including family offices, individual, wealthy individuals, they get, they get, they get treated like they're retail, like as if they are tourists. And there's a big fee, or pr pr not price, uh, a widespread between the bid and the offer. And so at Bannockburn, what we try to do is try to improve transparency so the client knows exactly what they're paying. We try to improve the margin so they can get a more, by us buying a lot, we can, mm. we can give small, we can give like group, uh, bulk discounts, if you will, mm. uh, to smaller participants. And we try to provide them that transparency, price efficiency, and then mm. bring with us the, the tools and the uh, products that are available now that are readily available from banks, but, but a lot of small, medium-sized businesses don't know about them or don't know how to use them. And so we try to help these clients with their risk management and using the appropriate tool to, to, to make them more efficient uh, positioning. Oftentimes it's hedging, not speculating. Mm -hmm. Love it. Okay, Mark, great to see you. I appreciate the conversation so much. It was really uh, lovely. Uh, to hear about, you know, the stories behind some of these moves as well. It's, it's great too, to talk to a Canadian who's not saying A a lot. <laughs> <laughs> saying what? A? Do you say A? A, huh? <laughs> a. Yeah, I guess I spent a lot of time in the States, Philadelphia, Chicago, and a bit in New York. So Good. I come by it honestly. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll speak to you soon again, Mark. Yeah, feel free. If there's something I can do, I, I, I like what you're doing. And so if something I can do, I'm happy to help out. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. All right.